and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Here in the show, we're talking to Emily Waters. She's a psychiatrist and she wrote a few Kevin MD articles and they're a little bit different because they're cartoons. And for those watching on the video, I am going to show them right now. And you can see here a lot of the cartoons, they are involved with patient education and specifically with the vaccines. So here we have blood clots in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, a comic explanation. Another, if COVID vaccines don't make you sick, why do some people feel sick? And today we're here to talk about Emily, about that intersection between patient education and cartooning. Emily, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right, so we'll get into those topics in a little bit, but first off, can you just share your story and journey to where you are today? I'm a community psychiatrist and I trained at Wayne State in Detroit and then did residency at Northwestern in Chicago. And um, I've been in the Bay Area for 11 years now. And for the last four years, I've, I've focused um, almost exclusively uh, on working with people who are homeless. And so some of the, the work that's involved has been, um, you know, I, I'm, based, I'm based in the county shelters for half my week, and then I'm in a clinic half the week. And I originally was just in the shelters and trying to see people short term and link them into the county clinics. And that, that was not working at all. And I think the part I started to see over time is that um, people who are homeless have extensive histories of trauma that date back to early childhood in many cases. And that it was really asking a lot to ask this person to meet strangers in a clinic mm -hmm. when so much of their experience with mental health has been very, very negative and involves psych emergency or jails. What I found is when I moved some of my time into the clinic and they could see me in the clinic and not have to kind of start all over and, and lose that connection, um, that it, it, it wasn't a big ask anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, that it, it opened this door that just hadn't been there for them before. Tell me how common is it for a psychiatrist to, to go to homeless shelters and deal specifically with the homeless population? Well, not as common as it should be. In the Bay Area, each county has some sort of team that does homeless outreach. And there might be one psychiatrist on the team um, occasionally there's more than that, but people who are homeless represent a, a huge part of community psychiatry. And I think that there's a lot of frustration with this population of, ah, this person's not showing up on time and, you know, and, and this kind of feeling that this person isn't trying hard enough when having, having learned more about this group of people, there's early childhood trauma affects executive function. About half of people who are homeless have had a TBI. Um, methamphetamine use affects executive function. And with all that in mind, I mean, asking someone to, to adhere to kind of a traditional clinic schedule just isn't going to work. And I think that many psychiatrists would find it tremendously satisfying to work in a shelter and, and keep a more flexible schedule where it's kind of like if you show up somewhere on the same day as your appointment, um, then that's, that's a success and I will see you. Now, you mentioned this earlier, but I was wondering if you could certainly go into more detail. So I'm a primary care internal medicine physician and uh, I see patients obviously in a clinic and if someone who is homeless comes to my clinic and from a behavioral health standpoint, what are some things that, that I need to be looking out for? What are some questions that I need to be asking? Um, I think a really valuable thing to screen for is PTSD. And, and there's a way I've learned to screen for it that, that I think is really useful, which is um, starting with talking about how that person does in crowds and if they notice feeling on edge or irritable or fearful when someone's either in their personal space, when they're in a crowd, or when there's loud noises. And if it's a yes to that, then, then kind of expanding into nightmares. If asking specifically about traumatic memories, I always frame it with that person that, um, you know, I'm going to ask this really focusing on now. Mm -hmm. 
And there's no need for you to have to go into background about trauma. Because I, I think the second that person senses this conversation is going towards trauma, um, it's, it's very common, they'll just close off. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but PTSD is extremely, extremely common in, in the homeless population and, and treating it um, can really be a, a game changer for that person. All right. So let's transition now into some of the Kevin MD articles that you wrote. And as I said before, they're not really articles. They are cartoons and they deal with patient education, specifically with COVID and the COVID vaccine. So tell me about um, how you got started with cartooning. I think that in in medical school, especially, I that was the way I would retain information was by making cartoons for myself and, and also a way I would just keep myself engaged with the material. And then in 2016, there there was the election, Mm -hmm. and it was another time I felt very compelled to make something that I felt the public could understand. Um, So I I made a comic about um, understanding narcissistic behavior and antisocial behavior. It, It took me a while to make it, but it was so satisfying because I felt there was things that I could say Mm -hmm. in the comic or through the illustration that really take a lot of words to convey the same thing. And then around that time, I also started doing some, um, some lectures with comics Mm-hmm. So um, I had just, uh, shortly after that, I started working at the shelters. So I did one on de-escalation techniques and using trauma-informed care when, when working with people in the shelter. And, um, and that was another one that just really lended itself to, to comics. And I, I think pictures are, are even though I'm, I'm not a particularly talented artist, but pictures are... Mm-hmm. So satisfying for me to make. And in some ways, I think um, I'm not burdened with having (laughs) tremendous artistic talent. And it helps me kind of distill things into into something, I think, simpler. And I think that is very helpful, especially in the age of COVID, because COVID itself is changing almost on a daily basis. And of course, as the vaccines become more widespread, that's also changing on a daily basis in terms of what we're discovering about the vaccines and in terms of potential side effects and short and mid-term complications. Now, the cartoons that you wrote in Kevin MD have to deal with the COVID vaccine. So tell me about some of the misconceptions that you're trying to help clear up. I think when the vaccines first came out, I was reading a lot about them and I, I kept kind of running into really with any article I was reading, there was like a gap. Mm-hmm. And and this kind of, and, and the feeling I had is that the person writing it decided, you know, the public isn't going to understand this part. So I'm just going to kind of glaze over this part. And what I have in mind, and, and this is informed partly through working with at working at the shelters, is, is that people are really scared. Mm-hmm. And when people are scared and they see gaps in, in the information being delivered to them, um, people fill in the gaps um, sometimes, uh, you know, with, with kind of fear-based ideas. Mm-hmm. And so I was seeing that the way people were filling in those gaps, mm-hmm. you know, were things like, you know, kind of more traditional things that we would see with vaccines. Like I heard the vaccine could give you COVID. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think that was one I, I really wanted to clear up with, with the first comic that was about the mRNA vaccines. And I also, I, I think, approached it from a, a, a perspective that I want to leave as few gaps as possible mm-hmm. Um, and, and try and make it inviting and not scary to look at. Mm-hmm. Because I think that's another way misconceptions happened is that um, people felt afraid. And, and many of my patients really stopped reading about COVID, um, you know, maybe a month or two into the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And, and so it, it was kind of ripe for misconceptions anyways, because there's so many already about COVID. Other misconceptions I wanted to clear up up front were the ones that were about um, the vaccine impacting DNA. And I think what I hadn't anticipated is that this was just the tip of the iceberg for for vaccine misinformation. 
And vaccine mis misinformation has extended so far beyond those kind of earlier ones that it, it feels a little, a little impossible to, to catch all of them. But at least that kind of basic framework is a place to start, I think. And I completely agree with everything that you say. I think that presenting what could be complicated medical information in an easy to understand pictorial format is tremendously helpful to patients, especially when it's something new like an mRNA vaccine. Now, what do you say to those um, other physicians who may push back and say, this is not serious medical literature, these are comics, and how can you pre present medical information as, as a cartoon? So, so what do you say to some physicians who kind of push back on this approach? Strangely, it hasn't come up. It probably comes up privately and just not, <laughs> isn't stated to me. But to me, I think our role is to present information that people are willing to read and that when it becomes more about kind of our, our own needs to appear, appear professional or serious, um, we, we lose the audience. Mm -hmm. And that we're kind of living in a time of, of um, people with extremely short attention spans. So I think anything that can kind of keep attention that's honest material is, um, is worth doing. We were talking to Emily Waters. She's a psychiatrist and she wrote a series of cartoons explaining the COVID vaccines and its potential side effects on Kevin MD. So Emily, take me through just a basic um, workflow of how you distill something that could be a complicated concept into a cartoon. Sure. So I usually start with um, spending a couple days reading as many articles as possible. Um, for the, the first comic, I also just bought a more recent immunology book <laughs> than what I've, I have left over from med school. And, and it's a great read. It's the book, um, How the Immune System Works. It's just a delightful, engaging read. So I, I read that book and then reread many chapters over and over before I felt like um, I could kind of start to see more of um, a story. And then I usually have a really kind of messy series of photos and I do it a little bit like making a storyboard more or less mm -hmm. for, um, which I, I used to make videos in, in medical school and I did a little bit in residency and, and with those I would storyboard. So I just storyboard for these, but no video mm -hmm. and, um, and do it in a way so I can kind of move the, the panels around and sure. show. And for those other physicians who may want to present patient information in a pictorial or cartoon or, or really distilling what are met complicated medical concepts into the simplest essence, what kind of tips can you offer them? I think it's great to get as much feedback as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, I have an eight-year-old daughter. She is one of my first readers and, um, and she really gives great feedback, but I, I usually start with people close to me for feedback. And then, you know, for, for these comics, I brought them to online groups, even like vaccine interest groups and, and just um, heard from people for a little bit before I, I made my final draft. Um, I, and I, I think when getting feedback, sometimes, especially strangers, can be fairly harsh. What I always have in mind is that there's often a kernel of truth and even really um, harsh feedback, and, and, and I try and take it seriously. And I also don't take it personally. Mm -hmm. And um, that if, if someone feels compelled to make something really harsh, it, it you know, generally doesn't really have much to do with me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that's that's an approach to take, you know, when, when kind of navigating those things. And especially when you delve into the world of social media and online forums, um, it's best not to take things personally. So give, give an example. What's an example of some criticisms that you receive when you put your work out there? The first one, especially, you know, it was, you know, people aren't going to understand this and it should be funnier, which is... 
you know, sometimes you get, it's like hard to make use of, you know, and, but I, I took the part about people aren't going to understand this really seriously. And then I decided, you know, the best way for me to see if people are going to understand it or not is to, is to start presenting it to people mm-hmm. and um, seeing not what someone thinks other people will think, but whether the person reading it understood it. And, and so that's the feedback I took most seriously was like, when I read it, I wasn't sure about this part. And my final question, what's your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? To me, I think we're in a really critical period where um, the people who were super excited about the vaccines have already, for the most part, gotten their vaccines. Um, but there's a lot of people who, who are on the fence. And I think um, individual conversations really matter. And, and I think something that I, I try and, a way I try and approach those conversations is, is really through the lens of trauma. Mm-hmm. where I, I think people have been really afraid for a very long time. And some of the fear about the virus gets mixed up with fear of vaccine. And that um, when it's possible, the more we can slow down, mm-hmm. it helps the other person slow down and, and be able to take in information. And, and I think when there's like a conversational approach to it, uh, you know, then, then minds become more open to hearing what we have to say, you know, and, and so as much as I love making these comics, I, I also don't want them to take the place of individual conversations. And so I would say they're like a accompanying piece, those individual talks. Emily, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Yeah, thank you so much.